Hello, I'm Marwan Sabah. I am the Moreno Family Chair for Alzheimer's Research Vice Chairman for Research and Professor in the Department of Neurology at the Barrow Neurological Institute. Today, I'm briefly going to discuss the value of early diagnosis and treatment for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so uh, these are the things we're going to kind of go through today. Uh, we want to speak to why it's important and what are the how to overcome some barriers. Uh, when we talk about Alzheimer's disease, as you see it here, uh, we're talking really about the dementia. The dementia is the end terminal phase of the disease, meaning the phase where they have cognitive decline with a functional associated functional impairment, the loss of independence. Uh, and it's now over 7 million people. That's expected to double by the middle of this century. And it is probably the biggest existential threat to the uh, aging population. Uh, and uh, uh, we expect the number of people to grow to 82 million over age 65 uh, by the middle of this century. So what we're seeing is, is that although the uh, the uh, prevalence is going, incidence is going down, the prevalence is going up because the number of people aging is going up. Now, people every day, every single day, ask me the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia. Let's talk about both dementia and mild cognitive impairment as categorical definitions. Mild cognitive impairment means you have cognitive decline with retained independence, and dementia is cognitive decline with lost independence. So dementia is a more advanced stage than mild cognitive impairment, and these are both categorical definitions, meaning they're the category, much like cancer. If you say cancer, your first thing is going to say is what kind, and in dementia, you should say what kind. Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Lewy body, vascular, neural pressure, hydrocephalus, many things cause dementia. So dementia is the category, Alzheimer's is the type, similarly for, for mild cognitive impairment. So the reason I say this to you is that, his, in, in, importantly, a physician, neurologist, geriatrician, primary care, psychiatry, should be able to find out where the problem is in the domains. Is it amnestic? Are they forgetful? Are they repeating themselves? Is it attentional? Is it executive? Is it organizational? Is it uh, uh, neuropsychiatric? So these are the things you really want to um, uh, probe when you're looking at cognitive decline. Now, I will tell you I'm a specialty neurologist at the Barrow Neurological Institute. I'm in the Alzheimer's Memory Disorders Clinic, and I know that we get these uh, residents, PGY3 residents for neurology uh, from primary care coming in, and they only learn still Still to this day, they learn you can only diagnose Alzheimer's with an autopsy. And that means that they're still using the old way of doing a diagnosis, meaning check a B12, check an MRI, check a, a thyroid. And if everything fall, default says everything is fine, it must be Alzheimer's. Well, that turns out to be frightfully inaccurate. So uh, uh, if you use the diagnosis of exclusion in primary care, it's only accurate 67% of the time, in specialty care, 75% of the time. So we're really pushing a, toward a disease-specific, biomarker-specific diagnosis. And the consequence is that people, physicians don't feel comfortable. They, don't, they, they know how to manage an A1C and a cholesterol, but they do not know how to uh, diagnose Alzheimer's. And so patients get worse and worse, and there's a significant delay, and some people are never even diagnosed. And we need to really push ahead with early diagnosis, particularly in the area era of this new pharmacological treatments. So I want to tell you that the reason this is also important is that we expect to see uh, healthcare burdens increase. Uh, we want to detect it earlier and earlier. We can help physicians, patients, and families start to uh, think about how they want to plan for the future, we might want to consider whether we're going for symptomatic treatments or disease modifying treatments or lifestyle directed treatments. And now we have, of course, the disease modifying therapies, which can help slow clinical progression. So when we talk about it, you know, for some of these people in this audience are skeptical. They're saying they shouldn't even bother. You should just uh, shouldn't tell people it's going to scare them. It's going to upset them, et cetera. I think that you, dementia world is unique in this regard. I don't think there's a single other uh, condition where you would actually think about doing something so limited. So uh, you, it is upsetting, but you have to do it compassionately. You have to take your time. You can't just walk out the door, say you have Alzheimer's or walk out the door. Do not do a hit and run diagnosis. 
You have to explain why they have cognitive issues. You have to have empathy for the patient situation. You have to really set it up. So what I do is in my initial consultation, I say, these are the things I'm worried about. Here are the tests that I'm ordering and here's why I ordered them. And in the next visit, we're gonna confirm whether these concerns are correct. And then I talk about in the second follow-up visit, confirming the diagnosis and talk about what are our treatment strategies. And so what I'm saying is that I have a proscripted way uh, uh, of delivering the diagnosis and managing the care. And if you think people don't want to know, I would tell you you're misinformed because the fact is, is that most people do want to know. They want to know if they're going to get uh, to dementia. They want to know if they're going to get worse. They want to know how they should plan their life accordingly. So it is the majority of people actually want to know if they have mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease. And so here's the other thing you need to understand is that caregiving is critical because the as you dement, the number of hours that are, are required for your care goes up and up and up. And you're seeing here that 11 million family members provided 18 billion hours of caregiving to the economic impact of $340 billion. And uh, I will tell you that uh, uh, caregivers really take it on the chin. They're depressed. They're actually, in many cases, predeceasing their own loved one with Alzheimer's because they're so fatigued. They're so isolated. They're so depressed. They're stressed out. And so uh, caregiving stress uh, is something we should address. And the other thing you need to understand is really take the time to, to articulate and move away from stereotypes. When you think that the stigma is the family don't want to talk about the disease, avoid interaction, that's just mis misinformed approach. You should be gentle, diplomatic, supportive, but you should not avoid it. Uh, uh, and so I just want to tell you that you really want to be open and direct, compassionate, sit down. That's what I tell all my residents. If you're going to give bad news, do it sitting down. Do not do it standing up uh, and do not be di discouraged. Feel, check your feelings, feel your own feelings, okay? This is upsetting for them, and in many cases, it turns out to be upsetting for you. So what I'm saying to you is that be in touch with your own feelings. Uh, so uh, uh, people are asked, how often do you discuss uh, memory loss? Uh, some people a lot, not some people not a lot. Uh, people want to be empowered. They ask, so what can they do? Diet, exercise, mental uh, cognitive stimulation, stress management. These are the things that people want to feel empowered. They, you don't want to take away their empowerment by taking away uh, the by saying the diagnosis uh, excludes other things. No, quite the opposite. In fact, patients really want to know what to do. So early on, though, physicians uh, are struggling with, and maybe even in primary care. What's the difference between normal aging and the beginning of an Alzheimer process? And the answer is that, uh, you know, tip of the tongue kind of things are fine. But if you're repeating yourself, saying the same thing, uh, forgetting uh, things, that would be not normal aging. If you're, uh, if you're uh, forgetting where you misplaced objects, that would be, again, if it becomes a rich, normal ritual and it had not been before, that would be uh, something that would be worth investigating. Uh, so what I'm saying is that there are ways to differentiate daily activities, and this is part of the history of present illness, from a normal aging process to a uh, worry about Alzheimer's process. And this is the kind of things you see. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, occasionally remembering a word or name is fine, but if, there, if it's a lot of tip of the tongue, can't remember the, the guy or the whatchamacallit, that's when you got to look into it more. And then you want to look into uh, decision-making and is that impaired as well? So the historical approach is a diagnosis of exclusion as opposed to diagnosis of inclusion. We actually now understand that not only are there cognitive changes occurring, but at the same time, there are neuropsychiatric features starting to emerge, including anxiety, irritability, withdrawal, and this is now has a new construct of mild behavioral impairment and can be uh, uh, associated with agitation later on. So MBI, mild behavior impairment, is now the parallel neuropsychiatric construction to mild cognitive impairment. And you should be aware that these can occur very, very early on. So when you approach it, I'm sorry this did not come out correctly, you at a minimum, at least in primary care, you know, do a diagnostic workup. Do not dismiss a complaint. 
if there is a complaint, evaluate it, refer it, work it up, but don't say there's nothing wrong, don't worry about it. And so I want to say to you that you want to do this, but you really want to also be thinking about the fact that there could be uh, disease-specific biomarkers now. So the benefits, I think I've already said this, are uh, care planning, initiation of therapy, ex establishing expectations, uh, decision-making, clinical trials, and other and lifestyle-directed strategies and management strategies. And uh, what we understand is that there are a lot of challenges. And, and first thing challenges us, right? The first challenge is we don't want to make a diagnosis. We don't want to do this. And so we minimize it or we discard it or we dismiss it or we delay it. Uh, so, uh, and first, if you get nothing else, you need to figure out ways to not do that. So best practices. One is recognize signs, symptoms. Uh, two, do a bedside cognitive screening measure like an ADA QDRS. Uh, three, uh, do a cognitive assessment, MOCA, mini mental, mini cog slums. Uh, do physical neuro, uh, start to lay out the, your worries, uh, refer, uh, work it up. CT uh, is not very good. MR for structural abnormalities, but we now have disease specific biomarkers and, and we actually have, uh, we'll talk about it for a minute here. A comprehensive evaluation should be done early. Uh, you can refer to a specialist. Uh, we now have the blood-based biomarkers starting to show up. We want to rule out other pathology, but we now have disease-specific tests like amyloid PET, CSF testing. And when you're not sure, I love neuropsych testing. Uh, so the disease-specific biomarkers are available and uh, they are, uh, uh, there's not research, these are now available. You can order them, you can use them uh, and they're, uh, they occur early. So they occur even prior to an onset of symptoms. So your biological changes are occurring much before you have onset of symptoms. So you should be thinking about use of disease specific biomarkers like plasma, amyloid ta and tau, uh, CSF testing of amyloid or tau or PET scanning. So then we move to strategy of treatment. And what are we trying to achieve? We're trying to achieve many things. One, if they have mild cognitive impairment, we want to prevent, delay, or postpone them from getting to dementia. And two is we want to manage the neuropsychiatric symptoms. And if they have mild dementia, we want to prevent, delay, or postpone them from getting to moderate stage. Because at the end of the day, we want them to retain as much independence as long as possible. So, uh, uh, like I said, I, I start out by not sidestepping the difficult conversation of the diagnosis. I plug in resources very, very early on, social workers, Alzheimer's Association, et cetera. We have a special nurse that kind of helps answer all those questions that they're not going to ask you during the visit. We talk about what are the other things going on, sleep, mood, uh, psychosis, uh, uh, driving, uh, things like that. So there's a lot of things you've got to think about in the diagnostic and management categories. Uh, uh, so uh, I think I just said this. Uh, and then I have something called shared decision making. So you don't just make a decision and you talk to your patients. And what I love to do nowadays is in my shared decision making, particularly after the diagnosis is, okay, option one is you would uh, give them uh, uh, symptomatic drugs like denepazil. Option two is symptomatic drugs plus DMTs like uh, lecanemab, denanenab, or symptomatic drugs plus a clinical trial. And then I talk about the advantages and disadvantages to each of these. So these are the things you talk about in shared decision-making. And the implication of treatment is that patients can be empowered to make their own decisions. Some people are like, heck no, I don't want those DMTs. Some people are like, absolutely. Most people are not going to qualify for DMTs. Talk about what to expect from the symptomatic drugs. Uh, and, uh, and so... Uh, really kind of think about how we want to use shared decision making and its implications for treatment. So the standard of care right now is the symptomatic drugs. This is denepazil, rivastatin, megalantamine, memantine. These improve symptoms. The fact is that there are to Alzheimer's what uh, uh, Tylenol is to arthritis, uh, but they don't fundamentally alter the progression. Uh, but when we talk about shared decision making, these are the things that you should think about or talk about. And uh, this is the kind of thing uh, uh, I, I patients want to know about and physicians want to know about. Uh, this is the this I'm giving you both sides of it. What does the physician feel comfortable saying? What does the patient want to ask but doesn't feel comfortable asking? And and these are the the, the surveys. In shared decision making, of course, you're saying that there is no one approach. 
Some people want DMTs, a lot of people don't. Some people want clinical trials, but they don't want the placebo. Some people want symptomatic drugs. Some people just want a lifestyle their way out of dementia. I have patients like that, uh, and they think that they can go keto and run on a treadmill and it's going to go away, and I wish them well. So you really got to think about uh, uh, decision-making and Alzheimer's disease and uh, talk about what to expect. And so these are the kind of things that you create a shared decision-making plan. And the key takeaway message is now that there's a biological condition that can be quantifiable using amyloid tau and other biomarkers. There are clinical tools and assessments available to identify mild cough and impairment due to Alzheimer's disease. I already talked about the biomarkers and we select our patients according to the appropriateness of the DMT. In conclusion, some age-related memory loss is normal. Uh, it occurs over, decade, uh, over decades, right? So the pathology is accumulating prior to onset of symptoms that the classic features are amyloid and tau, that genetics and other things can influence their impact, uh, but an early diagnosis is important. Thank you very much. <music>